Last week we had stopped, I believe, in the middle of our look at chapter 10 of the Tales of Issei. If you need last week's handout, uh, you will probably have to look on with a friend because I don't have any extra copies. It looks like they have all been taken. All right, so if you need an extra copy, uh, look along with a friend. All right, so let's read along. We may have gone over some of this last week, right, but let's review. So read along with me. Remember that in the Tales of Issei, many of the episodes begins with, uh, many of them begin with a line called Mukashi Otoko, or Aru Otoko. A certain man, having reached the province of Musashi in his wanderings, began to court a Musashi girl. Her father told him that she was intended for someone else, but her mother was delighted by the process, prospect of such an elegant son-in-law. And why would this be? Well, let's look at the uh, notation that's in parentheses. Although the father came of ordinary stock, the mother was a Fujiwara. Okay? And she considered a match with a nobleman entirely suitable and most desirable. She sent the suitor the following poem. Now, before we look at the poem, let's consider this, the background of both the mother and then the man, right? the man that is visiting this area of Musashi. Musashi uh, corresponds to roughly the area of present-day Tokyo and Saitama. Saitama okay, now the mother was delighted by the prospect of such an elegant son-in-law marrying her daughter. They are out in the countryside. Right? They are out in the countryside. Here a man from the city, a city gentleman, has come calling, has uh, come to visit them, and although the father of the girl is of ordinary stock, even though he's a commoner, the mother has Fujiwara roots. Roots. Okay, so she is of Fujiwara ancestry. Now, why is this important? Because, oops, I guess I don't have a note here. Um, the Fujiwara family, or the Fujiwara clan, as I may have mentioned in a previous lecture, um, increased, uh, rose to power in the Heian period. This is probably one clan, one family that you will want to remember uh, if you remember any family names from the, Fuji, uh, from the Heian period. In fact, sometimes parts of the Heian period are referred to as the Fujiwara period. It's because this particular family, this particular clan, um, was able to achieve so much influence and power over the imperial court. And we'll see why a little bit later when we talk about the tale of Genji. Right, the Fujiwara family will also play a role when it comes to looking at that particular narrative uh, tale. Right. Now, just know that because she is of Fujiwara descent or ancestry, um, she has noble uh, roots. Right. She's a member of the nobility, at least as far as her ancestors are concerned. That is why she would consider a marriage, a potential marriage between her country daughter, or country born daughter, and a man from the city particularly desirable, okay? And as would be custom or um, uh, expected of the, the nobility of this period, she is going to send a poem, a waka poem, to the suitor. And what does it say? Um, this is the use of uh, metaphor, uh, comparison of the young girl to a wild goose. All right, let's look at the poem. Uh, the wild goose tearing on the surface of the field at Miyoshino cries that it looks toward you and toward no other man. All right, so she is comparing her young daughter, young maiden, to a wild goose on the field of Miyoshino. It cries toward whom? Well, no one else but you, young man. Right, the man that I would like for my daughter to marry. Okay? And of course, uh, as would be custom or uh, fashionable in those days, he would be expected to reply immediately. You know this now. This is part of the courtly exchange uh, that took place in the Heian period. And this is the man's poem in response. When I might forget the wild goose that tarries on the surface of the field at Miyoshino no crying that it looks toward me. Right, so he knows that the daughter, and at least the mother <laughs> of the daughter, have interest in this potential marriage. So he is responding that, well, how, how could I possibly forget your daughter, the young maiden, right? 
uh, when I might forget the wild goose. Well, I obviously will not, is what he's saying. Okay. Even in the provinces, this man did not depart from his customary behavior. Right, now, this particular line in the text, this man did not depart from his customary behavior, is an indication of what aspect, what trait that we talked about last week. What sort of um, courtly elegance, uh, refined sophistication do we find being displayed by members of the nobility? in the Heian period, especially in the Heian period. I can see several of you thumbing through your notes from last week. Yeah. What term? That's right, somebody said it. Yeah. Miyabi, that's right. So Miyabi is the kind of courtly elegance, refined sophistication that men and women, especially of the nobility, were expected to display as part of the courtship process. Right? They were expected to know um, how to exchange courtly poems. Right? They were expected to have that knowledge of the previous canon of poetry that had been written by that time, and then they were expected to be able to use that in their own poetry. All right? However, look at this line again. We have, even in the provinces, this expression at the very beginning of the line. Mm. This is in contrast to the refined, sophisticated ways of people living in the city, in the capital. Right? Even in the provinces is, we can see, as the author's point of view, the author's criticism, perhaps, of people living in the provinces, people living in the countryside. Right? So what is this an indication of? Probably contrast between the city life and country life. Let us look at this. city life, right? So even though this city gentleman, a man from the Heian capital, uh, has come to an outlying province, the countryside, he is still able to display this miyabi, right? Courtly elegance, refined sophistication. Now this could be seen as a contrast being made between miyabi and another term, hinabi. What is hinabi? This would be a lack of the courtly elegance or refined sophistication that you would expect in the Heian capital or of members of the nobility. So you are going to probably find that people living in the countryside who have been there for some time and display the awkward um, country rustic type character uh, characteristics um, or behavior this is what you're going to see uh, being depicted when we talk about people living away from the capital. And often, uh, the case is that this awkward country rustic who displays the characteristics of uh, Hinabi is going to try, make an attempt, to imitate Miyabi. I'm going to try to attempt the ways, to imitate the ways of the uh, court nobles. They might try to exchange fancy poetry, right? romantic poetry. But often is the case, as often is, is the case, uh, they are not successful right, in imitating the ways of the court nobles. And pretty much they are being uh, laughed at. Right? They are being criticized by the author uh, in especially many of the chapters of this particular monogatari, the tales of Ise. So let's look at a few more examples of how the author um, criticizes those living in the country, compares them or contrasts them with those living 
in the Heian capital. Right. Uh, look at slide 21. Right, this is chapter 14 in the Tales of Ise. Once, a man found himself in Michinoku. I remember that Michinoku is in the northeastern part of the country. And in the course of his wanderings, he finds a girl living there, right, in Michinoku. This is far, far from the capital. A girl of the province, who was probably unaccustomed to meeting people from the capital, fell head over heels in love with him and sent him a poem as countrified as she was. Right, so here, right from the very beginning of this chapter, we can see that the author is not particularly um, uh, approving of this young girl living in the province of Michinoku. Right. She, probably unaccustomed, not used to meeting uh, Miyabi, courtly, elegant gentleman from the capital, uh, falls head over heels in love with him, and then decides to send a poem to him. She knows that this is the custom of the day. This is what is expected of courtly men and women. But unfortunately, according to the author, the poem is as countrified as she was. It's as rustic and awkward as this young girl is. Let's look at her poem. Far better it were to turn into a silkworm, even for a while, than to be tortured to death by a foolish passion. Right? Uh, this particular poem is a little bit difficult to interpret. Uh, we can see that silkworm in the original Japanese is kuako. Right? kuako. And what is, what is she saying here? She is saying that if she is going to be tortured to death by this foolish love, right? this love, she has fallen head, head over heels in love with a city gentleman, she'd rather, uh, even if it's for a short time, mm, turn into this silkworm, this kuako. That's what she is saying in her poem. And then, let us see what happens. So again, this is an example of Hinabi, right? Let's see what happens. What is his response? Remember, he is a man of the city, of the Heian capital. This is our sensitive aristocrat, exemplified by our model, uh, Ariwara no Narihira, a man like him, at least. He must have pitied her in spite of her crudity because he went to her house and slept with her. He left in the middle of the night, whereupon she sent him the following poem. Right, so what does he do? He doesn't um, leave. He doesn't uh, turn away. He doesn't reject her uh, poem and her, uh, her advances. In fact, he accepts them, and he decides to spend the night with her. Right, so this is something that would be expected of courtly men in the Heian period, right, especially a man like our model, our Mukashi Otoko. Now, what is her poem when he is about to leave um, and uh, has to depart because uh, dawn has broken and uh, the roosters have announced the arrival of daylight? Uh, this is a signal to lovers uh, that they must depart. In most cases, it's going to be men, right? Because it was the men who made their visits, nightly visits, to the woman's house, to the woman's residence. When dawn breaks and the rooster cries or crows, then they know it's time that they have to leave. Usually, you will want to leave uh, when it is still rather dark or at least not light enough outside to be seen by perhaps the neighbors or other people. Right? You want to be uh, leaving undetected by the people in your surroundings. Okay, so let's look at the poem. When daybreak arrives, I'll toss him into the sister, that pesky rooster, who raises his voice too soon and drives my lover away. Right, so this sister in the original Japanese, this is another poem that is actually rather difficult to interpret, even for modern scholars. Uh, in the original Japanese, kitsu, all right, and it is believed that this is probably some sort of container, right, that the uh, young woman wants to toss the pesky rooster into because he has cried too soon and forced her lover, the uh, city gentleman, to leave her house. Okay. Presently, the man sent word that he was returning to the capital. Right? So this is a very, very short-lived affair, but it does give us some indication of what um, sensitivities, what uh, uh, what things appealed to 
the people of the Heian period, right? and especially the author of this particular monogatari. Right? This is what was expected. This is the kind of behavior that was expected of people living uh, in those days, people of the upper classes, obviously. Right? This is one scene of um, uh, one scene from the Tales of Issei, chapter 14, which depicts this uh, city gentleman's departure. Mm. Notice that he is kind of looking back toward the woman who is hidden behind the curtains. Right? He's looking back as he makes his way out of the house, or out of the residence. Uh, and we can kind of detect from this particular illustration or depiction that he is probably feeling some sense of guilt, perhaps, leaving so early mm, uh, before uh, dawn has really even broken. Right? So this is an interesting, I think, illustration of this particular episode. Okay. Now, uh, irogonomi is another concept that you will want to be thinking about, another theme that you will want to be thinking about when we look at tales like the tales of Issei, also uh, characters like Hikaru Genji in the tale of Genji, also the five suitors that we saw in the tale of the bamboo cutter. All right. Let's look at this. This um, concept is one that um, refers to a man or a woman's strong liking for the opposite sex. All right. uh, it can also refer to that particular person. Right, someone who uh, will enter into romantic affairs, right, someone who is well uh, informed of and skilled, well acquainted with uh, the art of courtship, the art of romance. And so someone like our mukashi otoko, someone like uh, Ariwara no Narihira, the sensitive aristocrat, or men like uh, the men in the tale of the bamboo cutter, right, who pursue Kaguya Hime, right, the beautiful young maiden from uh, the celestial palace on the moon. And we should note that this particular term, right, irobonomi, is not necessarily, not always used in a negative sense. Right? In fact, if you look at, uh, for example, the tales of Issei, right, sometimes this idea of irobonomi is used uh, in praise. Right? So someone who displays uh, irobonomi might actually be highly evaluated right, by the author and probably by many readers of the Heian period. Now why is this possible? Why is, this is a little bit uh, surprising I think, right, for people like us living in modern society. Right, this is a little bit surprising by our standards. Why is it possible? Because in the world of literature, again, we are talking about um, fictional tales. They may be based in part on historical events, historical people like Ariwara no Narihira, but again, it is still a fictional work that we are reading. So this fictional <coughs> world of the monogatari allows for some freedom. And this is something that you would expect, I think. It allows freedom from those social restraints uh, that might um, prohibit or inhibit someone from pursuing so many romantic relationships or affairs with different people. So it gives us some room to deviate from reality. And we will see uh, another example of the Iromonomi in uh, the tale of Genji, when we look at its uh, hero, its protagonist, Hikari Genji. Again, the uh, five suitors in the tale of the bamboo cutter, Taketori Monogatari, are also described as Irogonomi in the original tale. Okay, I move on. Let us look then at the last of the chapters uh, that I have selected from the tales of Issei. Okay. This one is probably one of the more amusing or entertaining chapters uh, in this work. So let's look at it. Read along with me. In former times, a certain lascivious woman thought. All right, so this woman is um, prone to uh, romantic thoughts, uh, 
desire to enter into a relationship or an affair with um, a handsome man. Okay. So in former times, a certain lascivious woman thought, I wish I could somehow meet a man who would show me affection. It was, however, impossible for her to express this desire openly. She therefore made up a most unlikely dream, called her three sons together, and related it to them. Two of them dismissed it with a curt reply, but the youngest son interpreted the dream as meaning that a fine man would certainly come along, and the old woman was delighted. Now notice, she is described as an old woman. She already has three sons, and they are grown sons. So we are talking not about a young maiden, right? like the young maidens that we have seen in the other chapters. We are talking about a much older woman. Right, with three grown sons, yet she would still desire uh, to enter into a relationship with a handsome man, a handsome man that would come calling on her and show her some affection. All right. So the son, the one of the three sons that does uh, listen to her and uh, decides that, well, he needs to do something about this situation, uh, thinks to himself, other men are cold-hearted. Mm, I wish that I could bring her together with Captain Narihira. Right, probably a reference to our model again, Ariwa, Ariwara no Narihira, who is the model of Miyabi, right? Courtly elegance, and perhaps Irogonomi as well, in contrast to other men who are rather cold hearted, who would not take the time of day to listen to a request from a woman like this, a woman who is so old. Uh, and already has three grown sons. I would not take um, a moment of their time to listen to a request like that. One day, the son uh, met the captain while the latter was out hunting. He seized the bridle of the captain's horse and told him of his request. The captain took pity on the old woman. This is a similar expression, uh, one similar to the text that we saw in the earlier chapter. Right, so he takes pity on the old woman, he feels for her, her situation, visits her house and spends the night with her. He slept with her. He did not come again though, and the woman, uh, the woman uh, decides to go to his house. Right, now this is a little bit unusual right, for the Heian period. Remember that it was usually, in most cases, the man who would make the visits to the woman in earlier periods as well. Remember, we looked at poetry from the Mayo Shu. We talked about sumadoi, right? Sumadoi, the uh, nightly visits uh, that the men would make to the woman's house, right? He did not come again, and the woman went to his house, where she stealthily looked at him through an opening in the fence. She, here she is, spying on him. The captain, catching a glimpse of this old woman, recites the following poem. So obviously he is doing this intentionally. He knows that he is being spied upon, and so he reads the following. Right? Uh, someone a year short of a centenarian. In the original Japanese, this is momotose, right? so 100 years, so centenarian, someone 100 years old. Momotose ni hitotose taran. Right, so this is someone one year short of a centenarian. So supposedly she is so old, or at least she is uh, in appearance, uh, someone who looks to be 99 years old. So that's how old she appears to be. Hair disheveled and white, or it's kumogami, seems to be in love with me. I saw her in a vision. Ware wo kourashi omukage ni miru. So this is what he says as he is being spied upon by the old woman. When the woman saw him saddle his horse and prepare to leave, she rushed off in such great confusion that she was not even aware how the thorny shrubs and plants scratched her. So imagine this is what is happening. Uh, the woman spies on the man. She hears this elegant poem being read about her. Uh, she immediately senses that he is probably going to now make his way over to her house. So she de decides that she must rush back quickly to her residence in order to be able to be there waiting for his arrival. Right, so she's running back uh, along the path, uh, running through the thorny shrubs, not caring that they are scratching her. And then she returns home, uh, lays down on her sleeping mat, 
and waits for his arrival. While well, the captain stood outside, secretly watching all of this, uh, as she had done at his house, she recites the following, pretending as if nothing had happened, right? She had been there all along waiting for him. Shall I have to sleep all alone again tonight on my narrow mat, unable to meet again the man for whom I long? Right. Uh, narrow mat is the samushiro, mushiro is the mat all right, that she is using to sleep on. And um, often we find this expression in, in Waka poetry, koromo katashiki. In other words, um, this, is, this entire phrase is an indication that she fears that she may have to lie down on this narrow mat, mm, narrow that it, is, it only allows room for one person to sleep on it. Right? And so she is using this expression to indicate her fear that she might be spending the night alone rather than with Narihira. Right? Um, it is a general rule in this world that men love some women but not others. Narihira did not make such distinctions. Right, now this, again, is surprising, I think, by our standards, right? our modern, uh, modern day standards. But again, if you recall a while ago that I mentioned, uh, in many cases, this uh, sense of uh, iromonomi, right? or miyabi, was not necessarily used in a negative sense. And even um, Edo period scholars, and the, this Edo period is going to be a much later period in Japanese history, even scholars in the Edo period uh, viewed this particular appraisal of um, Narihira as a positive one. Right? So they're not uh, necessarily uh, critical um, comments uh, by the author on Narihira's behavior. All right. Okay, so that is um, all we have time for uh, to look at uh, the tales of Ise. So please, if you will, look at the next handout, and that will be the one on the tale of Genji. Genji Monogatari. Everyone have this handout? Okay, um, the title of Genji, most of you have probably at least uh, heard of its title, if not read uh, a few passages uh, from this most, probably most well-known uh, monogatari, or work of narrative fiction, long narrative fiction. It is described by Edward Seidensticker, who has done a translation uh, of the tale of Genji. It has been described by him as the supreme masterpiece of Japanese prose literature. Okay, and it is now really uh, known not only in Japan by pretty much uh, every, everyone in Japan, but also by the world over. Many, many people in many different countries have uh, access to the tale of Genji now, that has, now that it has been translated into many different languages and studied by uh, scholars, not only in Japan, but um, across uh, the globe. Uh, the Tale of Genji was completed uh, in the early 11th century, right around the turn of the century, a few years after the turn of the century. So in the early 11th century, it was completed. Uh, it consists of 54 chapters. So this is a very, very lengthy tale. And it is one that offers us not only an exciting, a very dramatic uh, story, right, with a plot, with characters, many characters, uh, but it also is uh, a tale that offers us a vivid picture of Heian court life. Perhaps not um, entirely uh, historically factual, right, but it does give us uh, a good glimpse into what Heian court life might have been like during the time it was written. So this is going to be uh, 10th century, 11th century, uh, Heian period Japan. The lifestyle led by, again, the court nobles, men and women of the upper classes. 
Here we have a couple of uh, illustrations from an emaki or illustrated narrative scroll, this one on the tale of Genji. There were several emaki uh, produced in the Heian and later periods. And these are again narrat narrat uh, narrative scrolls that have been illustrated with um, paintings or pictures right, that show famous scenes from the tales. Mm -hmm. Uh, here we have uh, Genji Monogatari Emaki, uh, the chapter on Azumaya. Right? This one completed in the 12th century, so sometime after the actual tale was written. Uh, this one on the right, uh, Genji Monogatari Emaki uh, Minori, also this Emaki completed in the 12th century. Uh, and so again, if you look at these illustrations in the Emaki, you will notice uh, examples of how the nobles lived back in those days. Mm -hmm. For example, I've marked a few pages, and I'll go ahead and pass this around. So take a look at it, thumb through the pages. You'll notice, for example, examples of the uh, folding screen, the view that I uh, mentioned in last week's lecture. Some of these are illustrated themselves with paintings of our natural uh, scenery, surroundings, landscapes. You will also see examples of uh, a goal game board. Uh, this is a, a, a game board that is similar to a chess board. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll notice how the um, court nobles, court nobles have um, acquired these games, these toys, and they are seen sitting around playing with, uh, playing with them. And you'll see how the uh, women are dressed, for example. You'll notice that in many cases they are hidden behind their curtains, especially when a man might be calling to visit them. Uh, here, a man is playing a biwa. Remember the biwa from one of our earlier lectures? Uh, this is that stringed instrument. We will encounter uh, the biwa again when we talk about the tale. Tales of the Heike. So go ahead and take a look at this example of Emma. Okay. Now this tale was written by a woman, a woman who served at court in the Heian period. Her name was Murasaki Shikibu. Murasaki Shikibu. She served one of the consorts, or one of the wives, of uh, the emperor who reigned at the time, and that was Emperor Ichijo. Right? Uh, the consort that uh, Murasaki Shikibu served was named Shoshi. Right? Shoshi, let's look at her, was the daughter of the Fujiwara family. Right? Remember this very powerful clan right, who ruled, uh, or helped to rule, uh, during uh, most of the Heian period. Uh, Shoshi was the daughter of Fujiwara no Michinaga, right? and she will eventually become consort or chubu to the emperor Ichijo. And she will uh, become the mother, she will later bear him sons, and those sons uh, will go on to be emperors themselves the emperor Go Ichijo and the emperor Go Suzaku. All right? And I bring this up because of her marriage to the emperor Ichijo. Remember, she comes from the Fujiwara family. The Fujiwara family is not the imperial family. Be sure that you can distinguish this. Right? They are not originally um, associated with the imperial family. They are one of the more powerful clans, yes. But uh, they are able to achieve that power by marrying their daughters into the imperial family. Right? So her marriage is one prime example, one very good example, of a politically arranged marriage. These marriages were quite common in the Heian period. They actually occur much earlier, right? and they will occur after the Heian period as well. But um, you can consider this part of the Heian period perhaps the heyday of politically arranged marriages, especially when it comes to the Fujiwara clan. Right. They will achieve their political um, height, or height in their political power. Um, they will really um, pretty much control most of court politics right, by this time. 
So let's look at that uh, in a little more detail. Again, we see the rapid rise in the Fujiwara family's uh, power and influence, and this is going to be power and influence over the imperial court. How do they achieve this? Through, again, politically arranged marriages and sekkan seiji, which is a sekkan politics. This is the kind of politics that relies on family ties to the imperial family. And they achieve those ties by marrying either their daughters or perhaps sisters into the imperial family. They marry them to the emperor himself or perhaps his firstborn son, who would be the crown prince and eventual heir to the throne. Uh, good examples of uh, Fujiwara leaders who were successful in uh, using politically arranged marriages to achieve higher and higher posts uh, at court and to achieve more uh, power over uh, the court. Two examples would be Fujiwara no Michinaga, again the father of Shoshi, and then his son, Fujiwara no Yorimichi. Fujiwara no Michinaga uh, was um, regent, he held the post of regent, and usually in Japanese this is referred to as Sesho, right, Sesho. Uh, the Sesho is responsible for assisting the young emperor, and I emphasize the word young, when the emperor has taken the throne, assumed the throne, but is still too young to rule on his own, that is when the Sesho right, will uh, assist him in running the country, in managing the affairs of, uh, of the country. And so that is the post of Sesho, and Michinaga was able to uh, achieve that post. He was father of four daughters who were eventually married into the imperial family and grandfather of three emperors. Right, so not only does he have strong ties uh, as father-in-law, father-in-law to uh, the reigning emperor, but he eventually becomes grandfather of a reigning emperor. Right, so his rule, as you might imagine, is extended by that. So he's able to exert his power, his influence, over uh, the imperial court for a very long period of time. His son, Yorimichi, uh, holds the post of regent for some 52 years. So he says so for over five decades. And also is is um, chancellor or kampaku, right, kampaku. So he holds both of these very, very powerful posts at the imperial court. Uh, the difference between kampaku and sesho, uh, again, I mentioned that sesho is someone who uh, assists the emperor while he is still very young, too young to rule the country on his own. After the emperor has come of age, then his um, assistant, so to speak, uh, the person assisting him in running the day-to-day -day affairs would be called Kampa. And so that's the main difference between this, the two uh, posts. And again, these are two of the most powerful posts at uh, the imperial court. Yorimichi was also uh, responsible for building the temple Byodoi uh, at Uji. Right? And we'll look at Byodoi here in a few minutes. Okay, so now uh, let us look at how Genji is depicted in this tale. Right, it's not surprising that, uh, when I put this up on the screen, uh, it's not surprising that Genji is depicted as the ideal prince. Right, the ideal prince. Uh, he will enter into numerous romantic affairs. Right, so he enters into a number of relationships with different women. Now how is this possible? Mm. What uh, is the uh, idea of irogonomi that we saw a little while ago? It was socially acceptable right, for a man uh, to enter into these relationships. Right? It was not looked down upon, it was not criticized. In fact, sometimes it was praised, right, as we saw a while ago. The other thing that would probably allow something like this to happen is the fact that in uh, ancient Japan, polygamy was practiced among members of the nobility, and uh, it was widely accepted, as we saw earlier with the um, story of Prince Karu, 
and uh, his sister. We saw uh, polygamy um, in the case of other uh, works of literature from ancient Japan. So this is not an uncommon practice at all. Right? But we should also keep in mind that there is probably more to these romantic relationships and affairs than simply uh, romantic love. In many cases, as we will see in the tale of Genji, Hikaru Genji, our hero, is going to enter into some of these relationships uh, not for romantic love or not purely for romantic love, but for other reasons. Right? And that would be political gain, social gain, or a rise in social status, an elevation in his social status, uh, how he is viewed by his peers, his contemporaries, and also for financial gain. Right, and this is an important point to remember when we analyze the story. Why does he enter into so many, so many uh, affairs with different women? Okay. Now, if you recall, when I talk about economic gain, political gain, etc., you probably will remember uh, this fact. It was the paternal support that women, right, that women had from their fathers that would play a key factor in the marriage uh, of that woman to a man who might be calling on her, to her suitor. Okay. So the man would look to a woman's father for financial support, for political gain, for the possibility of a better post at court. Right. So this is another dynamic that is in play here. Right. So these, probably at least these three things, would allow for something like this to happen. Right? But, as you probably would imagine, uh, in the case of Hikaru Genji, right, there is not going to be um, gain without some sort of loss. Right? And that loss, or sacrifice, is going to come in the form of personal loss. Right? He's going to have to pay, in some way, for his gains, for his successes on the political scene, financial support that he receives from his uh, wives' fathers, right? uh, the fathers of the women that he uh, establishes relationships with. Yes, he is able to make those gains, but he does have to sacrifice in other ways. Right? And that is what makes for most of the um, appeal, I think, of this particular romantic uh, narrative tale. Okay, um, let us look then at slide one. All right, slide one of your handout today. This is going to be chapter one. We will start out slowly. And we will look first at the um, uh, background of our hero, his birth, right, and his, um, uh, how he grows up in the court of his father. His father is the emperor right, in reign at the time. All right, so let's look at the birth of uh, Genji, Hikaru Genji. This chapter called the Polonia Court, or Kiritsubo. All right, Kiritsubo, it's a type of tree. In English, it's referred to as the Polonia uh, tree. So let's read along. Uh, in a certain reign, there was a lady, not of the first rank, whom the emperor loved more than any of the others. This is very important, this very first opening line. Lady, not of the first rank. This indicates that she probably does not have very good or very strong paternal backing. Right? She probably doesn't have the support that other noble women would be expected to have if they were going to be making a career at court, right? if they were uh, intending to marry into the imperial family and um, secure a strong position for themselves. Right? But this is not the case for this young lady. However, despite that, despite the fact that she doesn't have a particularly high rank at court, the emperor still loves her more than any of the other ladies. Right? And this is going to create some problems. The grand ladies with high ambitions thought her a presumptuous upstart, and lesser ladies were still more resentful. Everything she did offended someone. 
Probably aware of what was happening, she fell seriously ill and came to spend more time at home than at court. The emperor's pity and affection quite passed bounds. No longer caring what his ladies and courtiers might say, he behaved as if intent upon stirring gossip. So normally you would not expect a man, especially a man of um, disposition, to throw caution to the wind, to be so indiscreet in, in his affairs, especially an affair with a woman of such low rank. Right? If the woman had stronger political and paternal support uh, at court, if she, for example, were a member of the imperial family herself, then he would not have to worry about uh, reproving stares, right? disapproval from uh, the people in his surroundings. But this is not the case. Right? However, this emperor does not seem to be uh, concerned with the disappro disapproval uh, from those in his court. Right? He does not seem to uh, be worried about his, the consequences of his actions right, with this young woman. Let's see what happens next. Mm. His court looked with very great misgiving, they're very disapproving, they don't like what they see happening. Uh, they looked with very great misgiving upon what seemed a reckless infatuation. In China, just such an unreasoning passion had been the undoing of an emperor and had spread turmoil through the land. So here, the author is using an example from uh, Chinese history. Right, to um, indicate the disapproval that the court uh, felt for this emperor's reckless infatuation, right. this romantic um, affair that he's having with this woman of not very high rank. As the resentment grew, the example of this uh, Chinese woman, uh, Yang Kuei-Fei, was the one most frequently cited against the lady. Right. In Japanese, usually this is referred to as um, Yokihi, the name of the woman who was supposedly the undoing of the emperor in Chinese history. So this is an example uh, being used by the author to uh, indicate the disapproval right, of the court. She survived, the young woman, however, survived despite her troubles with the help of an unprecedented bounty of love from the emperor. Her father, mm, let's see what has happened. Uh, her father, a grand counselor, was no longer living. This is why she doesn't have the high rank that would, necess that would be necessary for her to achieve a stable position, right? security at court, especially if she's going to be uh, entering into a relationship with the emperor. Right? But she doesn't have that paternal backing. Her mother, an old-fashioned lady of good lineage, was determined that matters be no different for her than ladies who, with paternal support, were making careers at court. Right, so her mother is still trying right, her very best to make the most of the situation, the best of the situation for her daughter, even though she is at a disadvantage. The mother was attentive to the smallest detail of etiquette and deportment, yet, there was a limit to what she could do. When she tries, she makes the most um, of the situation, but there are limits. The sad fact was that the girl was without strong backing, and each time a new incident arose, she was next to defenseless. It may have been because of a bond in a former life that she bore the emperor a beautiful son, a jewel beyond compare. This is the birth of our hero, our protagonist, Hikaru Genji. The emperor was in a fever of impatience to see the child, still with the mother's family. And when, on the earliest day possible, he was brought to the court, he did indeed prove to be a most marvelous babe. The emperor's eldest son was the grandson of the minister of the right. The world assumed that with this powerful support, he would one day be named crown prince. But the new child was far more beautiful. Now let's look at this. Um, it may have been because of a bond in a former life. Mm, what is this? We have seen this a number of times in the previous works of literature discussed in this course. It may have been because of a bond that we had in a former life, a bond that the young woman and the emperor shared in a former life 
that would allow her to bear this beautiful young child. How, how was the bond described in other lectures? Anybody? Yes. Karma, karma affinity, that's right, you remember that, the Um The karma affinity, so this in the Japanese is probably going to be referred to as skuse. Remember this word, this term, skuse, or sometimes shukuen, sometimes uh, innen in modern Japanese is another word we could use. Right, so it simply, again, it refers to this bond that people believed uh, held people together, connected them, and it was a bond from a former life that would predetermine the actions and events, things that would happen to you in your later life. All right? And supposedly, uh, the bond that uh, this young woman shares with the emperor was uh, a particularly strong bond that would allow her to bear him a beautiful young uh, child. And this is Hikari Genji. Right? How is this baby described in this passage? There are several. Uh, lines of text that we should focus on. One, he is described as a beautiful son, a jewel beyond compare, uh, a most marvelous babe or baby. The child was mo far more beautiful than his older brother. Right? So Genji has an older brother. This older brother obviously has a different mother, right? and she will be introduced later on. Her name is Kokiden. Uh, it is expected that the older brother, who is the eldest son in the family, uh, is going to be the next in line to assume the throne because he is the firstborn son of the family. However, we find that Hikaru Genji, when he is born, is far more beautiful than the eldest son. The eldest son has better backing, right? His mother is the daughter of the minister of the right. At the minister of the right, the minister of the left, both of these positions are very powerful positions at court. Right? So you would expect, um, in political terms, that the eldest son has a much better chance. He would be favored to take the throne. Right? But people begin to think, well, maybe this is not going to be the case after all. Because here we have this beautiful child born to the emperor and this woman, and everyone knows, everyone at court knows, that the emperor favors the young woman, right, rather than the mother of uh, the eldest son and the other ladies as well. Right? She is the one that is most favored by the emperor, so obviously a son, a beautiful son like this born to them, is going to be uh, perhaps more favored than any other child. Uh, these descriptions probably have given you uh, an indication, a hint that, again, here the protagonist is being depicted as our ideal prince, ideal nobleman, right? Still a child here, obviously, in this part of the story, but someone who is going to grow up um, into uh, a nobleman, a good example of a um, court aristocrat, a member of the nobility that has the abilities and accomplishments that are necessary to um, succeed at court. We saw this uh, elsewhere. We saw it with Kaguya Hime. Remember Kaguya Hime? Uh, the ideal woman, the ideal noble woman, right, with superhuman qualities, in fact. Uh, we saw it with uh, Ariwara no Narihira in the tales of Ise. Right, he was de described as the sensitive aristocrat. Right. Okay, now, uh, what happens next in the story? I'm going to put up on the screen now uh, just a few quick points that will give you an outline, a brief summary of what happens in the next few passages. You don't necessarily have to write this down or memorize it. It's for your convenience because this story is so long and rather um, complicated, the characters, uh, their relationships that um, uh, come onto the scene, it is rather hard to follow along, so I'm going to give you a quick summary first, and then we'll look at the actual text, okay? 
Uh, what happens next? Well, the other ladies of the court, uh, obviously, they are jealous of the special affection, the treatment uh, that Genji's mother receives, especially now that she has born this beautiful young child. And they will continue to intimidate her, ostracize her, harass her. Right? They try to give her as hard a time as possible right, to make her feel unwelcome uh, at court. Eventually, as a result of this, her health will decline and um, she will pass away. Right? So she will pass away and when she does, Genji is still a very young child. Right, probably no more than um, three or four years old. So he has very little um, memory of what his mother looked like. He has vague, vague remembrances, vague memories of what his mother uh, looked in appearance. Right? But um, all he is able to do is rely on what the other people at court, for example, the ladies in waiting who knew his mother, he relies on their stories, what they tell him, to um, create a picture in his mind, an image in his mind of what his mother looked like. Okay? And obviously the emperor is going to be stricken with grief and it's going to take him some time to recover right, from this loss. Okay, so this is what is going to happen in the next few passages. Turn now to slide four in your handout. Uh, I need not speak, this is the author speaking, about Genji's accomplishment, accomplishments, the young Genji, the young boy. Right? I need not speak of his accomplishments in the compulsory subjects, the classics and the like. When it came to music, his flute and koto made the heavens echo. So here we already have indication that Genji is skilled uh, in the uh, compulsory subjects, the classics, and also in music. So he already is displaying those qualities that would be befitting a member of the nobility, right? He is a member of the, the nobility, imperial family, right? but he is particularly well endowed with these skills and qualities that would be expected of a court nobleman. Now, the next passage is um, something that a sage from Korea says about Genji's facial appearance. This visiting sage uh, from Korea has been asked by the emperor, by Genji's father, to read Genji's facial appearance, right? To read it, to be able to foretell the future, to see what Genji's future holds for him. So let's see what the sage has to say. It is the face of one who should ascend to the highest place and be father to the nation. He said quietly as if to himself. But to take it for such would no doubt be to predict trouble. Yet it is not the face of the minister, the deputy who sets about ordering public affairs. And this is a rather uh, uh, complicated uh, passage that we need to analyze, I think, a little bit um, more carefully. It is the face of one who should ascend to the highest place and be father to the nation. So in other words, the sage is looking at Genji's facial appearance and saying to himself, well, mm, it's quite obvious that this young man is eventually one, uh, is going to grow up to be one who should ascend to the throne, or should ascend to the throne and rule the country as father of the nation. But he knows that if that were indeed to happen in reality, that's going to create some political strife, political problems at court. Why? Because we know that Genji has an older brother, the eldest son of the emperor, who is expected to take the throne next. Right? However, even then, it would not be appropriate for, him, for Genji to simply assume the role of a minister or deputy, someone who is in charge of running the day-to-day -day affairs of the country in a managerial position, in an administrative type position. That would be a waste of his talents and his skills. <coughs> so let's see what the emperor has to say. Somehow, a news of the sage's remarks leaked out, though the emperor himself was careful to say nothing. 
the minister of the right, grandfather of the crown prince, and father of the Coquiden lady, was quick to hear, and again his suspicions were aroused. Right, so already, just this simple news, information of the sage's remarks, um, is enough to stir and arouse the suspicions of uh, the eldest son's grandfather, the minister of the right. Right, he suspects, ah, the emperor is probably already considering uh, giving the throne, the throne uh, to Genji rather than his grandson. Okay. In the wisdom of his heart, the emperor had already analyzed the boy's physiognomy or his facial appearance after the Japanese fashion and had formed tentative plans. So apparently the emperor has already begun doing this uh, in other uh, using other methods, Japanese methods, of analyzing one's facial appearance. He had thus far refrained from bestowing imperial rank on his son, and was delighted that the Korean view should so accord with his own. So secretly, he's very pleased that the Korean view, the Korean sage, has predicted uh, pretty much the same thing that the emperor believed all along. But, right? Lacking the support of maternal relatives, remember that uh, the boy's mother has died and her father has long since been dead, right? So he has no maternal support. The boy would be most insecure as a prince without court rank, and the emperor could not be sure how long his own reign would last. So in other words, he doesn't know how long he will be able to protect Genji, protect him from uh, the potential uh, political troubles, strife, and harassment that he might receive from other members of the imperial family, those who support the eldest brother, right, the grandson of the minister of the right. As a commoner, he, Genji, could be of great service. The emperor therefore encouraged the boy in his studies, at which he was so proficient that it seemed a waste to reduce him to common rank. And yet, as a prince, he would arouse the hostility of those who had cause to fear his becoming emperor. So he concluded that the boy should become a commoner with the name Minamoto or Genji. Right, so this is what happens. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, the boy uh, doesn't have a mother. The mother's father has long been dead. And so um, he doesn't have the necessary uh, political or financial backing to help him at court, right? So it's important for us to keep in mind that not only is this woman's paternal support a key factor in marriage and the success of the woman at court, it's also going to extend to the livelihood of the children born of those unions, right? Because usually, usually in most cases, a child is going to be raised by the mother's family in the mother's residence. All right, but this is not the case with Genji. He has lost his mother, right? And she herself had already lost her father. So he does not have um, the support from his maternal side okay, that he would need to uh, succeed at court. And so the emperor takes all of this into consideration and decides that the best course of action is going to be to reduce Genji to the status of commoner. Right, a regular commoner, not a member of the imperial family. But, let's look at what happens. Um, so though uh, Genji has been born a son of the emperor, right, he has direct connections, uh, he is related by blood to the emperor, he loses his rank as prince. Right, he loses his rank as prince, and he is made a subject of the crown. In other words, he has been reduced to commoner status. However, you will note, as we look at the um, following chapters, the rest of the story, uh, Genji will retain the qualities that are befitting a prince, indeed, the emperor himself. Right. And it is the predictions of this sage that hint at the kind of future uh, that awaits Genji. Right. Genji has no actual, right, no actual claim to the imperial throne, but by all other standards, he is the only man truly fit to lead the nation. Okay. 
So this is um, Genji's situation uh, as a very young uh, lad. Right, and we're going to see next um, what happens as Genji achieves adulthood, right, as he reaches adulthood, and he is married to a young woman, really just a young girl, uh, who is the daughter of the minister of the left. We will see that in the next few chapters. Has everyone gotten this down? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay, so in the next few passages, what happens? Well, the young Genji having lost his mother right, and lacking that um, support from his mother's side of the family, will move into his father's court. So he's going to be raised um, near his father. In fact, his father takes him pretty much everywhere. Right? She, he still is adored and loved by his father, um, who is still rather um, grief-stricken. He has not completely uh, gotten over the loss of Genji's mother. Uh, Genji will excel in his studies, as you might expect. However, an interesting turn or twist takes place in the story. The emperor, Genji's father, uh, will take on a new wife. Right? And her name is Fujitsubo. Right? Fujitsubo, the lady Fujitsubo. And this Genji is very drawn to the new woman. Right? She's, he's drawn to her. Why? Because Apparently, she bears a striking resemblance to his mother, right? to his mother that he has lost, and the mother he does not have uh, very distinct memories of. Right? He is told by the other women at court that the new woman, Fujitsubo, bears a striking resemblance to his dead mother. Right? So this draws him even closer uh, to the new lady. Right? Let's see how this uh, plays out in the story. Look at slide seven. The months and the years had passed, and still the emperor could not forget his lost love. He remained sunk in memories, unable to interest himself in anything. Then he was told of the fourth princess, daughter of a former emperor and a lady famous for her beauty and reared, oops, reared with the greatest care by her mother, the empress. She was called Fujitsubo. So already, the beginning of this passage, we can see that this new woman all right, does have the rank, the status that is required of someone who intends to make um, a career at court. Right, so she is being depicted in sharp contrast to Genji's mother. Remember, she um, didn't have the same kind of backing. The resemblance to the dead lady, Genji's mother, was indeed astonishing. Because she, Fujitsubo, was of such high birth, it may have been that people were imagining things, she seemed even more graceful and delicate than the other. No one could despise her for inferior rank. So she has no fear of being harassed or intimidated by the other women at court. And the emperor need not feel shy about showing his affection for her. He found his affections shifting to the new lady, who was a source of boundless comfort. And so it is with the affairs of the world. Since Genji never left his father's side, it was not easy for this new lady, the recipient of so many visits, to hide herself from him. Well, Genji is still a very young boy at this point, and so he is going to be allowed uh, to visit the new lady with his father. Right? And sometimes he is able to see her even up close, because again, he is still a young lad. Right? Though in her childlike shyness she made an especial effort not to be seen, Genji occasionally caught a glimpse of her face. He could not remember his own mother, and it moved him deeply to learn from the lady who had first told the emperor, Fujitsubo, that the resemblance was striking, and he wanted to be here, near her always. And so he finds that his attraction to this new young woman is growing uh, day by day. Gen Genji's affection for the new lady grew, and the most ordinary flower or tinted leaf became the occasion for expressing it. Kokiden, who is the emperor's wife or official wife, the mother of the crown prince, was not pleased. She was not on good terms with Fujitsubo, which is not surprising because she was not on good terms with Genji's mother as well, and all her old resentment at Genji came back. 
He was handsomer than the crown prince. People began calling Genji the shining one, right, Hikaru Genji, and Fujitsubo ranked beside him in the emperor's affections. She became the lady of the radiant sun. Right? These are the expressions that are used to describe these two um, characters. Again, an indication that we have now idealized, larger than life, romantic figures. Right? This is something that we saw in the previous literature. Uh, Kaguya Hime, remember that her name indicated shimmering, radiant beauty. Right? Uh, the uh, Mukashi Otoko of the Tales of Ise was a larger than life, sensitive aristocrat, romantic figure, the Irogonori. Right? So this is not surprising. We have the same sort of situation in the tale of Genji, our idealized, larger than life, romantic a hero and heroine. Okay? All right, if I move on. Okay, now what happens next in the story? Mm. At the age of 12, rather young by our standards, Genji undergoes his initiation ceremony and attains adulthood. All right, so young by our standards, but not uncommon at all for this time period. All right, so at the age of 12, he is going to reach adulthood. He's gone through the rites of passage. And um, he is going to be married now to a young girl who is actually a little bit older than Genji, slightly older than Genji, but still um, a young girl by our standards. He marries her. Her name is Aoi no Ue. Right? And she is daughter of the minister of the left, which is a good indication that she has strong paternal backing. Right? Her father has um, or is in one of the stronger positions at court. So you can probably consider this a good example of a politically arranged marriage. Right? So Genji is not going to enter into this relationship for love, uh, for the love, uh, for love that he feels toward Aoi no Ue. In fact, uh, the marriage is unfortunately for her an unhappy one. Right? So the, the couple actually does not get along. They do not get along with one another. Uh, she will eventually bear him a son, but in the story, uh, she dies in childbirth. She dies in childbirth, and interestingly, the supposed reason for her death in childbirth is uh, attributed to the evil spirit of one of the women who Genji used to see. Right, and that is the Lady Rokujo. We won't have time to look at that particular episode, but um, this young woman, Aoi no Ue, unfortunately dies in childbirth, and that death is attributed to the curse of the evil spirit of the Lady Rokujo. Lady Rokujo was scorned or abandoned um, by Genji. She was also an older woman, right? and Genji eventually tires of her and begins seeing other women, and uh, she cannot forgive him for this and comes back as this evil spirit. Okay, uh, however, even though he is now already married to this young woman, Aoi no Ue, he is unable to forget the beautiful Fujitsuko. Right? And Genji will succeed in arranging uh, a secret tryst or a secret meeting. In fact, uh, a number of visits are made. And um, this results in Fujitsubo's pregnancy. Right, so this is an illicit affair. Okay. Now, let's see what happens. Constantly at his father's side, Genji spent little time at the Sanjo mansion of his bride, Aoi no Ue. Right, Fujitsubo was for him a vision of sublime beauty. And now that he had come of age, he no longer had his father's permission to go behind her curtains. Remember that women of the nobility would ordinarily remain hidden right, from men that might be calling on them. On evenings when there was music, Genji would play the flute to Fujitsubo's koto and so communicate something of his longing and take some comfort from her voice, soft through the curtains. Life at court was for him much preferable to life at Sanjo. Sanjo is where again uh, Aoi Noe is uh, living. Okay. Uh, this is just an illustration that shows you um, what uh, the interior of uh, a residence 
that the imperial court might have looked like back in the Heian period. So notice again that we have the use of the curtains uh, that probably shielded uh, the women from view, right? especially when a man was calling on them. Again, we have some examples of the um, folding screens as well. Okay. Now, let's look at the next chapter, that is going to be chapter 5, called Lavender, and this is where we see what happens to Fujitsubo. Right? Something is not, uh, not right, all right with this um, relationship. Fujitsubo was ill and had gone home to her family. Genji's thoughts were chiefly on the possibility of seeing Fujitsubo. Right? He quite halted his visits to other ladies. All through the day, at home and at court, he sat gazing off into space, and in the evening he would press Omiobu to be his intermediary. She's one of the ladies in waiting. How she did it, I do not know, but she contrived a meeting right, between Genji and Fujitsubo. It is sad to have to say that his earlier attentions, so unwelcome, no longer seemed real, and the mere thought that they had been successful was for Fujitsubo a torment. Determined that there would not be another meeting, she was shocked to find him in her presence again. All right, so here she is trying to do her best, right, all she can, to prevent uh, another secret visit from Genji. And that is why she has gone home, in part. Um, but he has somehow managed to contrive, through the help of this lady-in-waiting, to meet uh, Fujitsubo in secret uh, once again. Lamenting the burden of sin that seemed to be hers, Fujitsubo was more and more unwell and could not bestir herself despite repeated messages summoning her back to court. Three months had passed and her condition was clear, so it is obvious now that she is pregnant with Genji's child. And the burden of sin now seemed to have made it necessary that she submit to curious and reproving stares. Her women thought her behavior very curious indeed. Why had she let so much time pass without informing the emperor? Obviously, those people around her, especially her ladies-in-waiting, think that this situation is very odd. Why is she waiting so long to inform the emperor of this news that would ordinarily be good news, right? auspicious news? Because everyone around her believes that the child is the emperor's, and she is the only one uh, who knows that that's not the case. Right? That's, that's why she is not able to uh, reveal the information. Omiobu, though, realizes what has happened, and she is aghast. Her lady had been trapped by the harshest of fates. Let's look briefly at this passage. Uh, there, again, are some references to burden of sin. Right, burden of sin. Uh, in uh, our analysis of this, we could probably uh, associate this to the uh, Buddhist ideas or teachings that uh, one must eventually reap what one has sown. In other words, you must pay for your own actions. Right? Eventually you will have to pay for something that you have done, maybe some wrongdoing in the past. Eventually it will come uh, back to you as divine retribution. In the Japanese, sometimes this is referred to as inga oho. Right? Inga oho. So something that you have done in the past will eventually come around full circle and come back to you as divine retribution. Okay. The very last uh, line here in this slide, the harshest of fates, probably most of you can pick up on this as another example of skuse or shkue that we saw a while ago. Remember the, the fate or the destiny that was predetermined by um, a bond in a former life? Okay. And why, why are these um, why are there so many references to Buddhist ideas and teachings? And you're going to notice this if you start reading chapters, if you start actually reading the text in the Tale of Genji. It's because, for one, during the Heian period, we do see um, an increased influence in Buddhism on especially the life of the nobles, the life at court. Right. And it's going to be the influence of new um, forms or new sects of Buddhism, right. beginning about in the early 9th century. So in the early part of the Heian period, we're going to see these new sects of Buddhism being introduced by monks 
returning from China. Okay. Um, you don't have to remember or memorize or even write down all of this information. I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the new sects that are introduced uh, at this time. One would be the Tendai sect, introduced by the monk Saicho. The other, the Shingon sect, introduced by the monk Kukai or Kobo Daishi. Okay. And really, it's one more that is more important for our purposes right now. Uh, and that would be uh, the Pure Land Doctrine, or the Pure Land Doctrine. And um, this particular doctrine, the Jodo, Jodo means Pure Land, uh, was introduced by the monk Enni. And it becomes very popular with the nobles, with members of the aristocracy. And it's so popular, in fact, that some will even go to the extent of building their own private temples or Amida halls. These are halls in which perhaps an image or a statue of the Buddha is placed so that the nobles uh, have immediate access to it, easy access to it, and they can offer their prayers or worship um, daily, on a daily basis. So this is how fervent, this is how devoted the nobles were in the Heian period. Uh, when it came to uh, religious worship. Right. So that is why we're going to see a lot of influence um, from Buddhist teachings, Buddhist concepts, on the literature itself. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to spend the rest of the class, just a couple of minutes, explaining now the um, discussion assignment for you, or right, to be thinking about. Please look at this handout. Please look at this handout, the one that says for group discussion. We have just completed looking at the tail of Genji through slide 14. Right? We have just finished looking at uh, chapter 5, Lavender, the part of chapter 5 that talks about Fujitsubo being unwell. She is pregnant with Genji's child. In the meantime, however, what happens is Genji will now encounter another woman, a very young woman. In fact, she is still just a girl. She's about 10 years old. And in slides 15 and 16, and then also in this handout, you will find excerpts from chapter 5 that talk about Genji's discovery of this young girl. She's about just 10 years old. Her name, Murasaki. Murasaki, and that is why the chapter has been called Lavender, because Murasaki refers to a plant that um, if you use the roots, uh, you can obtain a purple dye, or a purple dye from the roots. Right? So that is the, um, the origin for the name of the chapter, Lavender. Now, I would like for you, uh, over the next week, to read through the material in this handout. It's just a few pages from the last part of chapter five, all right, about Kenji's discovery of this young girl named Murasaki. He will eventually take her under his wing, all right, he is going to pretty much adopt her, virtually kidnapping her from her home, taking her under his wing, and he will decide to raise her himself. Now what I would like for you to do, as is indicated here in the uh, assignment, I would like for you to read the text and figure out what specific things does Genji do right, in this relationship with this young girl, Murasaki. How does he treat her? What actions does he commit that you find a little bit unusual? or perhaps surprising, especially by our standards, modern society's standards, right? Find specific instances in the text, specific lines, right? And then think about his motives. What is the motivation for doing those things, right? What is the reason behind Genji's behavior and Genji's actions? These are the two questions that I would like you to think about. Next week, we will, uh, at the very beginning of the course, uh, have a group discussion, or group discussions, and then a class discussion all right, regarding these two questions. Think about both, okay? Any questions? If you have questions, again, about the term paper, outline, or working bibliography, please come see me.